So this next panel is titled Brain Drain Opportunity or Epidemic? Covering the very prevalent issue of brain drain on the Arab world. Is brain drain a phenomenon that needs to be combated? And what does it mean for the Arab world's rising youth population? So Dr. Suleyman Hamalni will be moderating this panel. Dr. Hamalni is an instructor of investigation at Massachusetts General Hospital. He is the founder of Green Biomed, a US-based company for recycling lab and medical equipment. The panelists joining him are Aziz Abunim, the co-founder of Terjibia, a real-time translation application for refugees. Sada Saleh, the director of product and strategy for WASFI, a tech company that orchestrates, orchestrates data, humans, and technologies to solve complex problems. And Abudi Qattar, an investment analyst at Dash Ventures, a man based venture capital firm. Thank you, and join me in welcoming the panelists and moderators. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, so today's subject is about the brain drain, and well, like, what's the meaning of brain drain, and it's what's the difference between it and going abroad from Middle East for training, and then maybe coming back or not. It's, it depends on the person. But there have been a lot of controversies on this subject, uh, and for this, we will ask the first questions for our panelists. Is what do you think about uh, uh, a brain drain? Is it a good thing? Is it a bad thing? And uh, how our culture is looking for it? So we start with Mr. Al Yeah, that's right. Yeah, um, yeah it's, uh, I think that's a packed question. Uh, there's probably not like a binary, this is blank and good, blank and bad. Um, I, I, think, I think fundamentally, like, there there's the very, there's definitely the phenomena of like out of world brain drain, um, where uh, the the sort of like the top qualified people are leaving the out of world for often education, and only sort of like a small um, percentage of them potentially ever make it back to the out of world. So uh, like for sure it's happening, um, and um, uh, the whether like whether it's 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 good or bad, I think. That, the way I like to think about it, so of course, for context, the you know, for me, I went to school here, and then I moved to the Bay Area, and I'm still in the Bay Area, um, and and maybe it's more helpful to just sort of like share how I just personally think about something like this, um, and 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 it's it's really around um, what are some like what are some of the personal values someone would would hold and, and care about. If my if I believe my goal in life and goal is to be uh, an academic can do experimental physics and really uh, get my cutting edge um, uh, research and, and be a, 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 um, a renowned author in, in that space, then and if that's sort of like how I set my life values to be, um, it's probably a good thing um, because now I'm getting the opportunity to achieve my goals. If I'm a community centered person where I actually, my personal values uh, are around wanting to um, be able to contribute an impact or like the community, uh, my local community that I grew up with, then it's probably a bad thing for me. And that, as in like, it would actually uh, re return, like give me a negative returns and sort of like my uh, satisfaction of life overall, right? Um, I'll, I'll stop right here, but you know, this, is, this is sort of like, I think at the end of the day, it's like what, it's the projection of your own personal values on yeah. like your personal good or bad for yourself. Yeah, um, so first of all, I have to apologize because uh, the Boston weather got uh, uh, caught me off guard, <laughs> so uh, my voice is a bit uh, uh, choppy. But, uh, I think uh, from my, my perspective, I lived in the States uh, and I decided to move back um, a year ago. Um, and it, was, uh, it, was, uh, it wasn't that I didn't have a choice, I actually had the choice to stay or uh, move to Europe and I chose to go back and the reason for that is the opportunities. So just like what Aziz said, it really depends on uh, what you value and where you see yourself. But another, the question was, is brain drain a good thing or a bad thing? And I think it's a more high level question. So it can be personal, but at the same time, we also have to think about the economic and uh, social repercussions. So um, uh, from an economic perspective, the short term and long term, um, the term drain alone kind of indicates that it's a bad thing. And you have to stop that drain. Uh, we need to keep the good talent. 
But if, if the talent is not finding the, the position that they want or the opportunities that can help them grow, um, it's really, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense for them to stay. If anything, we should uh, support them in finding whatever opportunities they have or that they can get uh, elsewhere. Um, on the long term, it doesn't necessarily have to be a bad thing. Um, uh, so, for instance, um, people who move abroad will have an affinity to the region. Um, the network is not completely cut. Um, and as Ali said, it's not a binary thing. They don't go and then uh, it's just like everything uh, that they have back home just disappears. Um, there's a lot of uh, uh, good opportunities for them to connect, uh, uh, have a link to the region, they can mentor. Uh, there's a bunch of business opportunities and um, there's um, a lot of, um, um, it, there's a stronger opportunity for them to come back and take leadership roles. So in a, in a sense, uh, brain drain in that context is actually, um, in my opinion, uh, a really good thing. It's something that needs to be embraced rather than uh, uh, stopped. So I think it's actually a bit of both. I think that it's a good thing when people want to leave and they want to pursue opportunities elsewhere and it shows they're motivated and they want to find something better they have a home. But it's a bad thing because it means that we're not giving opportunities in our, in our own countries. Um, or at least on the surface it seems like that. Now I went back to Amman, having never lived in the Middle East because I wanted to pursue opportunity in the Middle East to make a difference to show that <coughs> this mentality in America where failing is accepted and failing is good is so powerful and so valuable, but it's not at all resonating in the Middle East. Um, and you're taught, even in high school and elementary school here, like fail means first attempt in learning. But in the Middle East, there's a stigma about it. It's, it's taboo, you know? So even, for example, when I was starting my organization, my parents have been supportive in everything I ever wanted to do. But when I told them I wanted to start a business, they were both so hesitant, because if you do something wrong in the Middle East, it taints your name for a long time. So how to address this is to start at a younger age, to teach kids at a younger age that it's okay to make mistakes, it's okay to, to fail in a business setting. Um, and that starts as simple as offering entrepreneurship courses at a younger age or just the mentality and how people think. Because right now, I, having lived in Amman and having you know, frequently traveled to the blind, there is opportunity everywhere. Even if you're talking about just physical space and environment, I mean, there's so much land, so there's, there's room to do things. But it's because we don't teach people in the right way or teach them that it's okay to fail through entrepreneurship that they don't come back and don't get back to the community. Uh, so, if we take it from the side that um, uh, think that brain brain, or they are talking a lot about brain brain, it's a bad thing, it's a bad thing, it's a bad thing, even there is a controversy. So, and they are, like, if you look for numbers, you can't find actually one single number, and you can't find uh, an organization that, uh, for me, I didn't find anything that an organization that is recording this, or recording your effects, or so do you have any idea about if, what are the real numbers if there are organizations that actually uh, um, uh, uh, monitoring uh, brain drain and if there is an effect at this time? Who would like to answer? So, um, Sarah? I guess um, we, we talked about this earlier, the brain uh, There's a very cool uh, uh, project that uh, uh, we're working on that uh, uh, it's about the Saudi diaspora abroad. Um, and it started with a question, or actually it started with a statement uh, that uh, some of the news outlets uh, were circulating that there are a million uh, uh, Saudis uh, living abroad. And it was a, it was a big number, there's a, the source was, I wouldn't say not credible, but like questionable. Um, so we started this quest uh, with a developer of our students to understand what, what, what the real number is, uh, how, how big is a problem, is it a problem in the first place? Um, so in terms of sources, there's a bunch of sources. The problem is, or the problem that we found was that um, uh, the sources don't, uh, they don't capture the nuances. So for example, the United Nations has a very um, um, uh, elaborated uh, data set on uh, migrants uh, from all countries in the world, where they were and where they end up in. But the problem is it measures both this, uh, the citizens and uh, uh, people who were born in the country. So if we were to if we were if we were to uh, look into the number of let's say UAE uh, migrants, it would give us the number based on uh, UAE citizens and um, anyone who was born in the UAE, which is not very accurate. Other sources could be, for example, um, some countries publish uh, data on uh, the work visas that they issue based on uh, the number, uh, the, the years, and the, the countries. 
Um, again, some countries don't, but like the, the major ones do. So those are um, other sources uh, of information. In terms of um, a third source would be surveys. Um, so that's unfortunately not being done a lot in the Middle East. It's a really cool opportunity if anyone's looking for a research topic. Uh, we really need the uh, insights into why uh, people who live abroad are living abroad. Uh, but in general, based on the, the, the research that we were doing, um, some of the insights that we found were um, a lot of the people or families who are living abroad want to come back eventually. Um, a lot of them leave not only for cultural reasons, but rather just to pursue opportunities. Um, and that's so surveys, public sources, with uh, NGOs, international sources. No, I mean, just to further the point, I think, I don't think there's an issue with people leaving to pursue better opportunity. I think in every culture, not just the Arab culture, people leave to pursue opportunity elsewhere. It's natural. You go up in the States, you want to go study in Europe, et cetera, et cetera. It's the fact that people stay. It's the fact that they don't come back. So I think there's, there's not enough, there's not enough focus on wanting to make children or youth give back to their communities in the long term. So, a lot of people think they'll go to college to, to acquire necessary skills and come back and get, get back to the sound or Jordan or whatever. But they get there and they realize that they're learning things that are much more, I guess, practiced in the States. So why would they come back, right? Mm -hmm. So the numbers, is, is the statistics you're talking about are very indicative that, that we don't do a good job of making people want to stay back home and get, get back to the community. Mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. That's a good point. Yeah. Do you have anything to add that we can't want to do? I think so. Why I wanted to move to the other point is when you actually uh, mentioned that we're not doing enough to bring him back. So whatever it was, a bad thing or a good thing, and people actually migrated or migrated to, to, to any part of the world outside of the Middle East to learn or to train. So what are we doing actually to bring these talents back or um, uh, make them contribute to the revolution in the Middle East? Uh, uh, from the government, from the private sector, even from families, from the culture. What, what are there? What tools are there to encourage, like us, to go back and do this and contribute? Um, I'll, I'll take this as someone who hasn't gone back yet. Um, <laughs> so um, I also think it's unrealistic for us to have this conversation void of like a political climate. You know, today, like you have the 400 million Arabs around the world from like the Arab world. Right? Um, probably more than half are either in conflict zones or uh, very struggling economic uh, areas. Right. These are critical government challenges. These are critical political challenges. These are challenges that go to a political system. You know, what, what would you expect of of, uh, of, uh, uh, of a Syrian student at MIT to do? This is a realistic question. This is a question that people actually face today. That you know, for some people, there's even no option. Right. Um, but at the same time, also, and this is why I sort of bring this up, is it also brings a lot of opportunity because it, it, it brings the opportunity for the Arab world. I think it's, it's like it's one word, it's meritocracy. Like, we don't have it. I don't think we have it. I think there's attempts at it, there's things around it, but there's still a lot of structure around like doing things the old way, where this concept of meritocracy that you will see here, you literally can show up in California today, not, no one knows anything about you, with zero network, uh, and not knowing anyone, and in one year you'll, you, you have accomplished something and done something. That's well, I, think you can, I think you can do that in Dubai. I think Dubai yeah. setting is changing the pace of the Middle East. And, and this is sort of like where I think I'm saying, uh, this is sort of like the opportunity that the Arab world has to do, is that they, you know, things like, um, you know, the United States has this extra, extraordinary visa program, right? Look, you have talent, you want to uh, talk to a school, you have, um, you know, really good uh, venture, you're, you're talented, there's opportunities and pockets that you, you should create this meritocratic system where not only can you build something that works, but actually, you know, a lot of people will stay in the U.S. realistically because they will also get a citizenship and guarantee their kids' future and uh, their kids go to school. There's a, it's a little more than just making a company that works. It's also quality of life, though, if you think about it. So one thing, salaries in Jordan, it's a joke. You can't live off it. You know, I'm fortunate enough to still be supported by parents, but if I had to live off the salary I was making in Jordan, I wouldn't afford water. You know, and I'm working in venture capital. So that's that's crazy, right? Um, so you have to give kids or give people the reason to come back. You have to give them incentivize like you have to incentivize them beyond just good opportunity in the workplace, but in, in life. 
you know, what is there to do in this country that's that's going to make me want to come back and raise kids here and have a family here? Dubai is setting pace, but, but the rest of the Middle East is, is honestly lacking in that sense. I, I, I think that uh, uh, we're trying to find a solution, assuming that uh, coming back is something that needs to happen. I really think that instead of countries trying to bring people back, I think they should just try to focus on how can we create a link where those people who are abroad and smart and talented and skilled can help in the country's development? I think that's much more realistic than saying how do we completely revamp our economy in a way that accommodates those people and fulfills their um, uh, career, social, and cultural needs. Yeah, that's a good valid point. So, it, training, um, or at least bringing some of the experience or training workforce from back home, that would help. But you talked about governments and they are not doing a lot. But we hear a lot about, even here in the US, everybody knows when you say I'm an Arab, there's a lot of money in all people. So why don't do, what are we doing here? So there's a lot of private sectors back home. So this private sector, why they don't do like some sort of capitals or uh, 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 financial grants or help for small businesses that are from here to go back into the Middle East and start to... I mean, it's, it is happening. There are accelerators, there are funds, there are, there are, there's a wave of entrepreneurship in the Middle East, 100%. It's just moving at a slower pace than it has to. Like, you saw a bunch of, a bunch of companies raise uh, seed and Series A rounds in the past couple of years, and so the expect, expectation is that this year and in the coming years there'll be a Series B and Series C, but what we're seeing is that a lot of these times they don't have the right structure and the guidance to get from Series A to Series B to become big players. So you have the Sooks and you have you know, the outliers, but there's no transitional period in the sense that we're still, we're still seeing a lot of seed in Series A in the early stages because after they get that initial funding, a lot of people don't know what to do with it and how to go forward with it. So there's not enough mentorship. They have the, they have the accelerators and they have you know, X, Y, and Z in that sense, but there's not enough focus on making sure the entrepreneurs are, are taught the right way and are doing the right things. All right, so I have a question. Uh, what is, whatever it was, uh, coming here for training or uh, training, what is the effect of Trump election on the brain drain and or training or leaving from Middle East coming to the United States? Is that an idea? I mean, I, I don't know about you guys. I, I don't. I mean, it's, it's part of the news. I don't think it's, unless there's like the legit legislation that, that we, out, we, I mean, did three years ago, if, if he was there, there was something that he put in line that he saw people coming to get an education or get a job and maybe that would affect me. Yeah, I think I mean, you can talk, talk about this more than I, but I know before he was elected. I actually not a month before he got elected. I think I think there's there's just there's just the fact that there's less people coming in the country. Or that, that's just that's just a fact. There's less people not just from back from, from from anywhere. Like the entire you know United States, uh, for instance, refugee program is also a form of, of bringing high talent people to the refugees. It's just a blanket statement for someone who can go home, but they're not. There a lot of them are skilled. But not. In fact, even the United States historically would only admit refugees who are skilled rather than you know, bringing someone. Yeah, yeah, why I brought up this question because I was reading that actually electing Trump is good for Middle East because a lot of entrepreneurs and talents are refusing to leave right now. They want to stay because they don't want to be. Um, well, that goes back to what you're saying about incentivizing people to yeah. stay in a country. It's, it's beyond the work, it's social. It's Lord, social. I move somewhere where I feel I'm not wanted. So, like in Japan right now, recognize that the actually population is getting older and less in China. and they're in Australia from a long time ago in Canada. So right now we can see in Japan that they are doing a lot of programs to actually bring small businesses, bring talents, bring give them citizenship, give them even money. Like I know we talked about this, but is there anything just to like to to oppose this effect from this government? Germany is doing the same thing right now. I know that in Jordan right now they started some program if you are an entrepreneur or you have uh, business or you have money, you can actually apply and get citizenship and we can help you in the business and give you free land. But other countries like Egypt, like you know, Saudi Arabia, the Gulf area, are they trying to help even themselves and the other poor Arab country to do that? 
I think the, the last part of your point is, is the most important because you'll find that maybe they're helping, they're willing to help people from their own country, but there's, there's just no sense of Arab nationalism. And I think it's a really bad thing. I think that as Arabs, we should walk around and say I'm Arab, not I'm Kuwaiti or I'm Egyptian, because they said that fosters a sense of community. But we don't. <laughs> But no, it's true. It's, it's a terrible thing. It's, it's generational. So, yeah. I, I kind of forgot your question, to be honest. That was just <laughs> <laughs> ah, the, the having people come, come and give back through business. Yeah, I mean, it just starts with it starts with making people like comfortable in, in situations where they're with other Arabs. You know what I'm saying? So you're not just. It's a good to have the Jordanian pride and Palestinian pride. I mean, I. Always say I'm Palestinian and helping proud people, but you also need to like realize that like the Arab Arabs should be united in the sense that we're not, and and a lot of things are so like misunderstood because of what they're seeing on the media. Like what people don't probably realize is that Egypt is booming, with yeah. entrepreneurship, booming. You never see anything about that, no. right? It's booming. I mean, we get so many opportunities in our VC from from Egypt, probably the most of any country. We you just never, you never see that anywhere else. So, so I'm, I'm just going to cut in. I'm really sorry. Uh, we're going to move into questions through Slido. So, if you want to submit your questions, we have time for maybe two or three questions. Slide questions. You want to choose them? They're they're already up there. So the people who are submitting them were accepting them. So the first question is to whoever from the panelists wishes to answer. As an engineering recent graduate, how can I best identify the opportunities worth pursuing in the MENA region? Any advice from your personal experience? I can't even spell engineering, so. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think uh, networking, I know it's a very uh, uh, huge term, but like talking to people in the industry, um, uh, reaching out to people who are doing things, uh, talking to people who are these people about how to meet. I think just like knowing what's happening is, uh, is, is very, very important. It tells you what's happening to there, there are, who's doing what. So. so the next question says, I care about the brain drain and I also care about the brain drain stories. So let's go with the stories. Tell us the story of your company, business endeavor, how did it start, how is it going now, what is the future? Uh. Mine started uh, when I was a junior at Babson. I knew that I wanted to get back to the Middle East, um, given the fact that my grandfather and my father both did a lot for Palestine. Um, but I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and I pivoted multiple times throughout the, the two years of, of sort of business, um, business starting. And so I met a young man back there called Ramir Rustam, who had set up his own organization called Fikr al Mashi. Um, and they were teaching refugees how to research English skills, and he wanted to go further to teach entrepreneurship. So I built an entrepreneurship curriculum, um, and we've gone, we've now taught three programs together to, to different refugees, two in Amman that I've taught, and one in Syria that I outsourced uh, the curriculum for. And so the way the business model works is that I now want to move into private schools, offering more intensive courses with guest speakers, lessons on PowerPoint, Excel, skills that you don't learn in high schools here, that you, but I want to give them an upper hand on students in the rest of the world and then use the funds from that to pursue more refugee projects. It's called Athlete. Um, well, uh, on my end, I was uh, based in New York. I was working at a data company or at a, um, a tech startup and I, uh, I ran into uh, my team, Fox Bella, who's uh, there at the back. We started talking about uh, technology in the Middle East and Saudi in particular. Um, I used to work in tech uh, before uh, moving to the States, and I felt that uh, there's a lot of cool opportunities that can be done that were uh, not done. Um, so I, I, I decided I was going to go study, um, and hope that uh, eventually uh, things will uh, mature. By the time I was talking to Bedir, things were um, actually happening. We were talking about a specific project, and at the same time, I was at a point where I had to decide on whether I would move with my company to London or um, quit. Um, so I decided to quit and move back to um, the region and help them. Yeah, um, so I finished my undergrad and master's here at MIT, so it's always good to be back here. Um, and uh, moved to the Bay Area, I worked as a software engineer for Palatine uh, for about two years and a half. Um, and um, so like the last six months of uh, me working at Palantir, I uh, ran across some people who were very involved with the refugee um, 
uh, problem in Europe, and they've spent a lot of time there, and we just spent a lot of time talking about how can we bring, bring our engineering skills to the problem. Um, and um, beginning of 2018, I quit my job at uh, Palantir to work full-time uh, at Terjumli, and I joined uh, Y Combinator at, as one of the tech nonprofits, providing um, volunteer translators to refugees around the world. That's what Okay, so I'm really sorry, but we're running out of time. So I'm going to have to thank our panelists, and please feel free to approach the panel.